Hey everyone, Charles here. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I want to look at a way that we can influence our traffic to do something other than what our IP routing table may want to do with that traffic. And that method is policy-based routing or PBR. Very simply, this is a technique that we can use to route packets in a network based on policies, or in other words, filters that we can selectively apply. First, we'll talk about how this works, and then we'll look at a practical configuration example. Let's jump in and take a look. Let's first discuss how normal routing works. Under normal circumstances, when a packet enters the ingress interface of a router, the router performs first a layer two frame check sequence, an FCS, and that's used to ensure that the packet hasn't been corrupted in any way. If the packet passes the FCS, then the router will remove the layer two header. Then it's going to reference its routing table in order to determine how the packet gets forwarded. This is of course based on the layer three destination IP address information found within the packet. If the router finds a path to the destination, then the packet is going to be re-encapsulated with a new layer two header and forwarded out of the correct egress interface. We can, however, influence this behavior using policy-based routing, or PBR. This allows us to override the default routing behavior. So using PBR, the router still performs a layer two FCS, and it still removes the layer two header. But this time, rather than basing our forwarding decision on a destination IP address, we do that based on instructions found within a route map. So let's make sure we understand the structure of a typical route map. This is going to essentially contain logic that will match packets and then choose a route for those packets. And there are two common parameters that we use with a route map, those being the match and the set parameters. Of course, depending on your version of iOS, you likely have many more parameters, but these are certainly the most commonly used parameters when we're talking about route maps. So first, when we are grouping packets, using the match command. We can do that in several ways, but commonly we'll do that by IP address using an access control list, or we might match those packets based on their size, where we configure a range between a specified minimum and maximum packet length. Once we have matched those packets, we then use a set statement to determine a route for those packets to take. For this, we have a lot of different options, and just to point out a few of those, we might want to set a next hop IP address, which would allow us to very specifically choose a different route than the default route, or maybe we would specify a default next hop IP address. That means the router will try to forward the traffic first based on its IP routing table. And if that doesn't work, then it would use the IP address that we specify with the set parameter. We might also specify a very specific interface that we want to use as the egress interface. Again, this can override the egress interface that may be chosen by the IP routing table. Or maybe we would specify a default interface, which is the same concept as the default next hop IP address, except we're referencing the interface itself. The router would first try the interface found in the IP routing table lookup, and if that fails, then it would use the interface that we specify with the set parameter. Once we have a route map containing our match and set statements, then we actually apply the route map to one of our router interfaces in order to use that. Here is the topology we're going to be looking at. We have a host PC in the 192.168.10.0 slash 24 subnet. Specifically, that PC is a 192.168.10.50 IP address. You can see that this connects into router one. Router one is acting as the default gateway for the client network. And this will eventually get us out to the internet through a couple of ISP connections. Each of those are using different networks. You can see ISP A is in the 10.10.10.0 slash 30 network. And ISP B is using the 20.20.20.0 slash 30 network. So to start out with here on R1, let's say show IP route static, just so I can show you what I currently have in place. You can see that I have a static route pointing to the 8.8.8.0 .8 .8 network, 
which I'm using as my internet destination. And that is going over 10.10.10.2. So that static route is pointing all of my traffic, all of my client traffic that's going to come from the PC over the ISPA router. Let's go over to our PC and let's first ping 8.8.8.8 to verify we do have connectivity and that does work. This is acting as a destination on the public internet and that is successful. Now, if we actually trace route this by saying trace route 8.8.8.8, let's see what happens here. And we can see our first hop is router one at 192.168.10.1. The next hop is 10.10.10.2. This is of course being directed over the 10.10.10.0 slash 30 network going to ISPA. And we're definitely going to use this route each time because of the static route that's configured on R1. And of course we eventually reach our internet destination of 8.8.8.8. So let's look at how we can influence this behavior by using policy-based routing. Let's go back to R1 and let's use PBR to influence our route to do something other than the expected routing behavior. Let's force router one to take our PC traffic and direct that instead over to the ISP B router instead of the default route using the ISP A router. So the first thing I want to do is I want to create an access list. This is the way that we identify the source IP address where the policy-based routing is going to be applied. This can be either a standard, extended, or named ACL. It doesn't matter in this case. So let's go under global configuration mode, and I'm going to say access hyphen list. I'll make that 100, and I want to say permit IP. So I'm not denying any traffic in this case. I'm simply using the permit statement to identify traffic, and I follow that with the subnet or the IP address that I want to target. So in my case, if you look at that client subnet, that is 192.168.10.0 with a 24-bit wildcard mask, so 0.0.0.255. That's going to match the entire host network. Now, of course, I only have a single host in this lab, but in the real world, it's likely that we would have an entire in-device subnet available. And at the very end, I'm going to specify the destination as any. So I want this to be able to reach any destination on the public internet. In our case, I'm sending all of the traffic from the client subnet over the ISPB router to be able to reach anywhere on the public internet. If you want to get more specific here, you can certainly use this for very specific destination subnets or addresses. We could definitely do that. In my case, I'm using any. So that's it. Just a very simple ACL to identify our subnet traffic. Now we want to create a route map. And we do that by saying route hyphen map, followed by a name for this route map. And you can be as descriptive as you want. Obviously, the more descriptive you are, the easier it's going to be to determine the purpose of your route map if you're looking at your configuration at a later date. So I'm going to call this one clients hyphen two hyphen inet. When I hit enter, that gets us under route map configuration mode where we need to take care of our two common route map components. Remember, we identified those as the match parameter and the set parameter. So first, let's say match. And if we look at our contextual help options, we have various ways that we can match this traffic. The option I'm going to use in this case is IP address. And if I look at contextual help here, we can indicate a named access list or the number of a standard or extended ACL. So in my case, I want to say 100 because that is the access control list that I previously created and I'll hit enter. So now our match statement is going to reference traffic that is identified by access control list 100. So now we need to use the set parameter to indicate what we want to actually do with this traffic. So if I say set, and again, look at our contextual help options, these are going to be numerous. We could do lots of things. We could set a default interface. We could set the interface, the default next hop. I'm gonna keep it simple here by just saying set IP next hyphen hop, followed by an IP address. And if you look at the topology, because we want this pushed over ISPB, we want to use that IP address. I want to say 20.20.20.2 .20 .20 
in this case. And the final step is to apply the route map to an actual interface. So let's back up into global configuration mode here and let's go under interface gig zero slash zero. If you look in our topology, you can see that this is the ingress interface for client traffic. In other words, all of the traffic from the subnet where the PCs are located, they're coming into this router on interface gig zero slash zero. So from here, I want to say IP policy and under contextual help, we're only going to see a single option, which is route hyphen map. And I want to follow that with the name of my route map. In my case, that was clients hyphen two hyphen inet and hitting enter will complete our configuration. Our route map is referencing access control list 100, which is identifying our client subnet traffic. And then our policy based routing is going to use this on the gig zero slash zero interface to influence the traffic. So let's go back to our PC and let's perform a new trace route command. Once again, to 8.8.8.8, our internet destination. And let's see this time where our path takes us. We can see that our first hop is still 192.168.10.1, which is of course router one. But this time we go over to the 20.20.20.0 slash 30 network. That's taking us toward ISPB, which goes against what the IP routing table says we should be doing on router one. A couple of verification commands just to wrap things up. On router one, let's break out of here and let's say show route hyphen map. This shows us the route map that we created. We see the name clients to INET. We see our match clause or our match statement, in other words, that is set to access control list 100. We see the set statement that is setting our next hop address to 20.20.20.2. And we can also see that we had some matches against this policy. We already had some packets being affected, which of course came from our traceroute command on the PC. We can also say show IP policy, and that's going to show us anywhere that we have a policy configured on the router. We see from this output that on the gig zero slash zero interface, we have a route map attached called clients to INET. That's specified as our IP policy for this interface. So that's a look at using policy-based routing to override the actions that our local IP routing table says we should take. I hope you found this content useful and I wanna thank you sincerely for watching.